welcome everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me all well. I would like to welcome you to our uh, webinar of today, which is called uh, Kenya's Water Buffer Recharge, Retention and Reuse. We are currently with 16 IC. I expect some uh, other participants during the um, meeting as well. This webinar is organized together with uh, the Water Channel and RAIN. Um, our speakers today will talk about their practical experiences related to the 3R approach. 3R stands for Recharge, Retention and Reuse. And this refers to a collection of techniques and management strategies to retain water above and in the soil. And we often use the word uh, water buffer for this. The aim is to buffer water during the dry periods in water scarce areas in order to um, extend the temporal availability of the water within a basin. This is exactly what our speakers will present. We focus on Kenya as many activities take place in Kenya. Um, before introducing you to our uh, first speaker, I would like to uh, inform you that this is a live and interactive webinar. The meeting will be recorded and you are all invited to uh, do two things actually. First of all, I would like to ask you if you can type in the chat box that you will find um, in the right bottom corner your name and your organization or the field of uh, work that you are working in so that we know that we have a clue uh, who is here. And secondly, I would like to invite you to um, ask questions in this chat box also. And for our first speaker, we will address the questions right after her presentation. And for the other speakers, we will wait until their presentations uh, have been done and then we will address the presentations in the last 20 to 30 minutes. So I hope you are ready for this. Um, ah, I see people already start typing. That's good. Then I would like to introduce you to uh, Basha Jankowski. She works at uh, RAIN in Amsterdam. She is a senior program officer over there. And she has a background in um, physical geography and has now work experience already for nine years in the field of water management. And this presentation will give you an uh, introduction to the water for food program, Rain for Food program, and Pasha will explain how to participate in this. Pasha, I will open your presentation now and then you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will not be using a webcam throughout the presentation because then uh, we can focus on the presentation, but just to introduce myself, as Lannick has said, my name is Pasha Jantowski. I work for the Rain Foundation. I've been involved in the Rain for Food program uh, since the beginning. I'm a senior program officer within RAIN. And before I start my presentation, um, actually, Lenneke, this is not the first slide. Can I go back? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to say that um, if you haven't already done so, please visit our website, rain4food.net. Uh, but what you can also do during, but also after this webinar, is follow our Twitter account, which is Rainwater for Food, and please also uh, tweet during the webinar to make this as interactive as possible. So I will have a short presentation about uh, the Rain for Food program. Um, first of all, I would like to inform you a little bit on, uh, on, on what we do, if you're not already familiar with our program. What we try to do with the Rain for Food program is to create a, a global rainwater harvesting movement. Uh, what do we do? Well, this program is mainly focusing on pooling knowledge between rainwater and agriculture, and specifically food security, by connecting people and organizations worldwide. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we work together with others and through others and therefore constantly seek partners and, ex and experts to expand our network. Within our program, uh, we have three main objectives which mainly focus on networking, making knowledge available and accessible, and also to focus on tools and pilots more on the innovative side of both rainwater harvesting and food security. So, uh, what we are currently doing um, is indeed trying to expand our outreach. And how do we intend to do that? We would like to work with both ambassadors and local hubs, because we really believe in the strength of uh, people to spread the word of our program. 
the people as indeed the ambassadors and the networks that we try to build locally are the hubs. We currently have several so-called YEPs uh, working for us in the field. YEPs are young water expert professionals. Uh, next to this, we also work with a large network of experts worldwide um, who not only uh, provide our pilots, ours and those of our partners with advice, uh, but also promote our program during different conferences and other kinds of events. Uh, next to that, we also are trying now to set up uh, different hubs in East Africa, West Africa and in South America. Um, we ju have just started it uh, and I would also like to draw attention to the fact that for the ambassadors and the hubs, we will soon launch a website which you can, then the announcements will be found very soon on uh, Rainwater for Food. So uh, please uh, visit the website frequently to learn more about our ambassador program. And then here uh, in the next slide, uh, you can see what we also are doing in our community of practice. If you're not already very active involved in the community of practice, please do so. It's a very crucial part of a program because this is our online platform to exchange knowledge. Uh, we see that there's a growing number of people there, so we're very enthusiastic about it from all over the world. Currently, we have practitioners from 66 countries who are participating in the community of practice and more than 250 members. So we're really proud of our program there and the exchange that is taking place. So for example, the picture that you can see here is from Myanmar and an NGO uh, shared their experiences with uh, roof water harvesting tanks in the community of practice, which led to a very interesting technical discussion. Uh, then uh, the other thing is on our website, uh, we have a so-called, which you can see here, Rainwater Wiki. It's actually a kind of uh, knowledge base. So what we have in, on our Rain for Food website is a wiki that holds information about practical tools, also about technology, which is linked to the Aquapedia that contains even more technologies in, uh, in water supply. Uh, but it also highlights experiences in different projects and pilots. Um, for now, uh, this part of our website mainly includes information uh, that we could have from our current partners and we really, really invite you all to share your tools or your technologies and your experiences in the field with us so that we can also promote those online. And um, here is an, uh, uh, one of our key projects that we're now not, taking, uh, not carrying out in, uh, in Kenya, but in the country next to it, Uganda. It's a project about uh, integrating wetland management and rainwater harvesting and wash in, the, in Rambu in Uganda. And um, actually, just very recently, a supervisory mission of uh, IFAD representatives took place there, together with uh, RAIN staff, and there was a global conference held. Uh, this project itself is it's, uh, carried out by our local partner called JESSE, in partnership with RAIN and Wetlands International, and with support of a local partner called the Uganda Rainwater Housing Association. Uh, it's actually called an e-pilot because it's focusing a lot on environmental sustainability in rainwater harvesting, wetland management and, and wash in this region. The pilot focuses uh, also on other so-called sustainability criteria and serves as an evidence-based learning uh, project on the integration of water harvesting and wetland management. Um, this pilot was actually also part of a um, public event here in the Netherlands in Amsterdam at uh, the venue called Pakhuis Zwijger and was there uh, showcased as a kind of role model for a catchment based approach. Uh, for us still this remains one of our most interesting pilots and you can also see updates of this project uh, online on our website. So please, if you have anything to share or if you have any questions concerning this project, we're very interested to hear it. Thank 
you very much, Pasha. I think yeah, that was sorry. the end of your presentation. Actually, there was still one slide, but it's not uh, included here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is all that I would like to say. So please uh, keep following our program, and we would like to get a lot of feedback from your side as well to see how we can still improve us. And like I said before, also follow our Twitter account, Rainwater for Food. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Pasha. Now, I would like to give the opportunity to the participants to um, ask the question to Pasha, if there is any. Up till now, um, there are no questions yet. I think, uh, Pasha, you uh, made a well, great effort in inviting all of us to join uh, your network and to share also our tools on your Rainwater Wiki. I think if nobody has questions so far, then we continue to our second speaker. And if anybody thinks of a question later on, then please keep putting them in the chat box. It might be addressed uh, afterwards. So our second speaker is Martin Omerwe. He's also working for RAIN as a program officer in Uganda and Kenya. His background lays in um, cultural anthropology and development sociology. And currently, he's also writing his PhD on the history of water development in the Kitui district in Kenya. So Martin will share his experience uh, from Kenya. I will now open your presentation, Martin. Thank you. You're most welcome to use your webcam if you want. Ah. There you are. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. I want to talk a bit about the, the context of uh, water availability in Kenya and uh, I have some examples from program areas where RAIN has some programs. It's in Kajado, the south of Kenya, and uh, Kitui, the southeast of uh, Kenya. Um, as Lenik already said, I'm, doing a, a, I'm still finishing a PhD research on uh, water technology, the history of water technology in the Kitui district, so some of the examples will come from that, uh, from that work. Um, what I wanted to share with you is a bit of the context. So when you talk about rainfall in, uh, in Kajado and Kitui, both of them are uh, so-called arid or semi-arid lands. And um, if you look at, uh, um, if you would compare it to the Netherlands, for instance, you would say, okay, the Netherlands is quite wet, uh, but really, uh, when you look at the statistics, it's not so bad. If you see uh, this, the, the statistic on the right, it's uh, from a town called Utrecht, which has an annual precipitation of 800 millimeters a year, which is roughly the same or yeah, just a bit more than Kitui district, which is a semi-arid to arid land, where annual precipitation is 720 millimeters a year. The, the essence of um, of the problem in Kitui is not that they don't have enough water, it's just the issue of when it is falling. So in the Netherlands we, get, we say it's quite wet, but the problem in the Netherlands is that rainwater is falling all the time but just very little. Whereas in Kitui you can see that the maximum monthly precipitation average is uh, 19, 190 millimeters and the minimum can be just 10 millimeters per month. In the Netherlands, it would be uh, eight, 80 millimeters, just a maximum, whereas it would be 25 millimeters uh, minimum. And this has some some profound effects on the on the landscape. If you if you see how water behaves in the landscape in the Netherlands, this is a an aerial picture from the same area of the Netherlands called uh, around Utrecht. You have a water course that would look roughly the same throughout the year. Now, and it's all nice and green around it. If you look at Kajado, uh, where some of our programs are, uh, are based, you see that it's also nice and green, but this is just during the few months of the rainy season. And this is the same area in the, in the dry season when, you've, uh, when all the water is drained off, all the vegetation has uh, turned brown or disappeared. So just, uh, just for some uh, some exciting visual effects, wet season, dry season, here you go. 
Um, so how do people get their water in, uh, in these areas? What you see is that m m during the rainy season, a lot of water is falling. The whole place turns green, but then shortly afterwards, the, all the water drains away into the rivers and uh, uh, yeah, away to the Indian Ocean, uh, basically. Um, but usually within these seasonal rivers that drain these areas, you can, you can dig uh, deep into the ground and some water is still available underneath. The advantage of this water is that it doesn't evaporate too quickly and uh, if you can get it, it's, it's still quite, uh, quite clean as compared to surface water. It is, however, quite labor intensive to get that water. You have to, uh, to dig deep holes uh, every time, uh, which is usually twice, twice a year after the floods, and you dig, uh, dig these holes and you, um, you reach some clean water there. Um, the, the alternatives are few. The, let me just check what the next picture uh, right. The alternatives are few. Many of these areas, particularly Kitui, uh, has a lot of trouble with the deep groundwater. Uh, gr deep groundwater sources can be salty. There can be a lot of salinity in the ground. Fluoride can also be there. Or sometimes the, the deep underground water is yeah, just too deep to reach with a borehole, or just uh, the reserves are too small. So a borehole might function a few years and then dry up completely. Um, and I want to, to, yeah, I want to, to tell a story perhaps about uh, an experience I had in Kenya to give, uh, um, to give a bit more context about how that works in, in, uh, in daily life for, uh, for people in Kitui. And um, this is an example that, uh, or this is an experience I had in 2009 in a, uh, a small town to the east of Kitui, which is called uh, Muda. And, um, this town, and it, I want to use this example to open a discussion on sustainability in water technology and also uh, choices that uh, you might want to make when you think about uh, implementing water technology. The, the story I have to tell is one of, uh, of a drought that occurred uh, just around the time that I uh, stayed in, uh, in Muda for a few months. And before that, or during that time, uh, Muta had been relying on a centralized water system that pumped up water from a, um, a seasonal uh, river. So the a deep borehole got into the underground water flow of that seasonal river. It uh, pumped all the, a lot of water to a, uh, to a big tank and then it flowed by gravity to, uh, to Muta town, which was 15 or 20 kilometers away from, um, uh, from that water source. So the whole town basically depended on that uh, water source. Now came the, the drought in 2009, which uh, depleted a lot, of alter a lot of other water sources in that area. And uh, more and more people started to use uh, that, uh, that centralized water system. The water was spread through kiosks, so I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, but uh, uh, this is the... This is one of these water kiosks where people used to be collecting water. And I'm saying used to be collecting water because in the middle of the drought, um, the, the whole scheme broke down. And the whole town of Muda and the surrounding areas were, uh, were left without water. So in this, uh, the picture, I'm not sure if you see the, the arrow, but uh, it's on the right up, is, a, is an old borehole. Um, that got into disuse by the time the, the pipeline was constructed, so that was no alternative source. The other sources that were around were the, the shallow wells. These had also been falling into disrepair because of that centralized water system, and, it, um, and people were, um, were waiting there also for the water recharge. During this drought, the water table just receded so deep into the ground that even at the seasonal rivers, people would be digging very deep to get the, the underground water. Um, you might be able to see there is a guy on a bicycle just uh, just here. He spent one and a half days uh, waiting for uh, water recharge uh, for two jerry cans to, to fill. So he slept there and he just stayed in uh, um, 
Um, he just uh, he just um, um, he slept there. He filled his it took two days to fill his jerrycan, and you can see ten people are still waiting. Um, the the situation got worse and worse. The uh, the few available surface water sources were um, were used by so many people that uh, that they got infected by cholera, and that year more than 40 people died in that district due to uh, due to cholera. Um, people were walking from Muga town 20 kilometers to uh, to reach the the water sources that uh, um, that still had some water, and that was in, uh, in uh, 40 degrees heat. And uh, still, they had to go back to uh, to their homes, which was another uh, 20 kilometers back. Uh, the donkeys died on the road due to exhaustion. Um, people were just carrying uh, 20 liters or 40 liters themselves back home um, over the uh, to to get water for their families. Now, uh, the the thing I wanted to think about is that from a water management perspective, if you have a situation of uh, uh, poverty, um, water shortage, and um, uh, very problematic issues in, in water management. What kind of structures would you uh, would you be putting in if it's to to address some of these issues of drought and uh, water provision for places like uh, like Muda? Um, I'm not saying that the the three R. A method or the three R technologies are sort of the the only solutions to water management in uh, arid lands or or Kenya in general or Uganda. Um, I'm just saying that uh, I think it has some advantages to um, as compared to bigger centralized schemes. So I want to take you through the three R's just to, to show a few examples, and then maybe at the end we can have a bit of a discussion about what is. Um, interesting uh, to think about uh, in, in, in these areas. So the, the next slide will show you uh, some of the 3R technologies. So this is a very simple, uh, simple thing. I think most of you judging from the list will have seen something uh, like this. It's a roof water harvesting catchment. Uh, basically, when it is raining, all the water is captured in, uh, in the tank. And uh, when it's not raining, you can uh, you can still use it. Um, yeah, it's simple. It's easy to maintain, particularly at household level. If you don't have to share all that water with other people, then you're uh, um, yeah. Then it's just um, this guy, for instance, doesn't have to walk to the well the whole uh, the whole year for drinking water. Um, in Kitui, there have been many innovations or or ideas about uh, water retention um, that have been developed the past, I think, 60 or 70 years. And one of these uh, in, in, interventions is a, a rock catchment. So basically, if you get a, a bold, rocky surface, um, you'll find that during the rainy season, a lot of water will flow from that rock. Um, now, it's actually quite easy to, to just put some some uh, some guttering or some uh, some uh, garlands as they uh, as they call them, leave the water into a small reservoir and that water will be available a bit longer. This is still uh, quite a, a small reservoir, but you can you can imagine that if a lot of water is flowing from from these rocks, um, you can construct bigger tanks. These are uh, 150 cubic meter tanks, and at this particular site, six of these tanks have been um, have been put. Uh, there, so you can calculate how much water is available there. Just water that is flowing from the rocks. The principle is also very simple. You use the rock as a big roof, and you store it in uh, uh, in tanks. Another technology that has been refined uh, the past 60 years in uh, the Kitui area, and uh, also yeah, many other parts of uh, Kenya are uh, are sand dams. You can see this picture. It's it's quite simple. It's a, a, a dam in a seasonal river, which blocks the water when it is flowing. Um, the the good thing about this technology is that it it doesn't store water in the surface, but it wants to store water in the uh, beneath the surface. Um, 
and you can see a bit how it's constructed. So this is a uh, this is the dam. Um, it's just a very simple masonry wall which is backfilled with uh, big stones and uh, and cement. And the idea is that uh, throughout the um, uh, rainy season, when it is filling, a lot of sand will accumulate behind the, this wall, and then um, the wall will um, the sand will hold all the water so it doesn't evaporate. And this is also another, so the, oh yeah, what I wanted to say is this, this is the example of recharge. So you recharge water into the, into the land, which you can use later during the, during the, the year. This is also a very simple and robust technology. It's a stone bund. Basically, it's just a line of uh, piled stones, which prevents uh, runoff from, um, from going downhill too quickly and allows water to enter into, into the soil so it doesn't flow into the, into the rivers and disappears to the sea. And this is for, uh, yeah, this could be a quiz, but um, uh, what kind of structure can you see here? Um, basically, you can't see anything because this is a subsurface dam. Uh, it's a dam that has been uh, put underneath uh, or in the riverbed, so the the very violent water storm, uh, the very violent water flows can just pass over it. But the underground water flow is captured uh, by that underground uh, dam or weir, if you uh, if you call it. Then reuse, the, the third component of, uh, of the three R principle. That's um, uh, this water that you, that you store in, in a tank, uh, you can still use it again, for instance, for, uh, for irrigation. So if you use it for, uh, for washing, if you use it for uh, cleaning uh, kitchen utensils, still you can bring it to the garden. And then uh, even if it is it, as it infiltrates, so, for instance, behind behind this dam, you can pull up water and use it for irrigation during the dry season. But uh, as it infiltrates into the into the land, it is still kept in the system. So, the principle of reuse basically is uh, to use water and to uh, to have that water keep uh, to keep that water in the system. Um, and that is, uh, that is, yeah, that can be considered the principle of uh, environmental sustainability. For me, the principle of environmental sustainability is that you, uh, that you don't deplete water sources that are not renewable. And many boreholes um, pull out water that is uh, difficult to, uh, to recharge. So in the end, you create a situation which is drier, whereas most of the three R technologies are um, geared towards keeping water in the system. And coming back to that story about uh, the drought, um, I would like to think that if areas like uh, like Muda, um, if they would have been fitted not with one sophisticated um, uh, water system which required management structures, which required maintenance and which required uh, um, yeah, uh, an engine to function and fuel to be, uh, to be available. If instead of that one structure you would have 10, 20, say 100 smaller dispersed structures which are not um, depending on, uh, on a lot of maintenance or on a lot of uh, management structures, then maybe uh, this drought uh, would not have had the effect that it uh, that it had. Um, I think, therefore, three, some of these three R technologies, which are just walls in a seasonal river, for instance, are uh, are quite uh, sustainable when it comes to to water provision for development in uh, in arid lands and also semi-arid lands and even uh, tropical or humid uh, lands basically because they require very little attention. And uh, we know this, or at least I know this, because I've been in, uh, looking at the history of the, of the Kitui district, and I think, ah, yeah, here is some. Um, 
when you when you go to these places uh, in Kitui, you usually find several structures that are still standing from the 1950s, uh, from the colonial uh, period. And uh, I've studied some of these structures. Um, these these two pictures you are seeing now are from the from the uh, district annual reports of the Kitui district. These structures were built by uh, colonial authorities, but also by uh, local elites. Uh, so local people from uh, from the area, and the principles that were uh, applied then were uh, are still apply now. So the last slide I wanted to share with you is uh, this is a, a slide of of a rock catchment, and, uh, and basically it's uh, the weir is still there, it still functions. And this is another slide from I think 1953. Uh, which shows a subsurface dam, which is basically a weir or a sand dam, uh, in another river. And uh, that time, uh, quite a number of them were built, and at least 13 of these structures are still operational in the in the area. So that is all I had to say. I think I'll uh, um, I'd like to share more thoughts, um, and I'll now give the floor to uh, to Lisa Lot. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Also, uh, interesting to see your last slides that history is still developing uh, over now. Um, I have seen that there are already some questions for you, but we will wait uh, for answering that once Lisa Lop has done her presentation. So I would like to introduce you all to our last speaker, Lisa Lop Tolk. She has carried out extensive research on climate change at the University of Amsterdam and works currently at Acacia Water as geohydrologist. Her presentation addresses mapping 3R opportunities in Kenya. Please, lot the floor is yours. I will open your presentation as we speak. So all participants are uh, invited still to uh, put their questions in the chat box. And then we will address them after Lisa Lot's presentation. There you go. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I want to talk to you about the potential for water buffering, especially in uh, northern Kenya, where we did a project indeed for mapping the potential of the different 3R techniques. And we did it with a landscape based approach. Um, my name is Lisa Lotte Tolk, um, and I work at Acacia Water. And we carried out this project together with uh, Aqua for All. IRC and in cooperation with the Millennium Water Alliance in Kenya. Let me go to the next slide. Yes. Well, the goal of our project is to identify the different 3R options which would suit in the area to buffer water to make it available in the dry period. Like Martin just told you, there are several options uh, you can choose from to uh, maintain the water which is plentiful in some periods in the year and which is lacking in some other periods of the year. If you can hold this water within the area, you can prevent the droughts. But the big question is, where can you put those options um, in the most efficient manner? And that's what we are looking at in this project. So it's really looking at the three R options and based on the characteristics of the landscape. Well, what are suitable options to buffer the water for the dry period? First, they must be area-specific, incorporating the possibilities and the limitations of the physical landscape. And on the other hand, they have to be locally demand-driven, fitting both in the socio-economic landscape of the area and in the demands and the ambitions of the people who will use them. Well, in this northern Kenyan area, the local socio-economic landscape is quite uh, violent. As you can see in the picture I put here, there are a lot of people um, carrying guns, uh, often to protect their own water sources, uh, but there are also a lot of migration routes through the area. So uh, different tribes are coming through the areas, which sometimes leads to conflicts. So that's the socio-economic landscape which we had to take into account. But where I will focus on now is on the... Oh, 
it doesn't do the next one. It is, is focusing on the physical landscape. And our partners in the project looked at the second part, uh, the socio-economic landscape. But here we will focus on what are the options just looking at the physical landscape. Well, there are various options for water storage. And well, Martin already explained you some examples. To summarize that is that you can either store it in the groundwater or you can store it as soil moisture in the root zone. You could also store it in closed tanks, for example, like Martin showed you, those closed tanks who capture the water from the rock catchments or the roofs. Or you can either store it in surface water retention. Now is the big question, what of those various three R options to capture water and make it available in the dry period fit the best at what location in the landscape? For example, if you think of shallow water storage, in that case you need a shallow impermeable layer to prevent drainage of the water to the deeper uh, layers. Um, if this impermeable layer is absent, shallow water storage is much more difficult. If you're thinking about sand dams, um, for that you need uh, seasonal rivers with the correct sandy sediment. And also, again, this impermeable layer on which the dam can be uh, based. Also, subsurface dams have similar characteristics and requirements as the sand dams. Those are, just to remind you, the dams that are built within the existing sediments within the river, so that the water, which is normally flowing through the sediment uh, away, through the ground, sorry, through the groundwater, is captured so that water can with well still be subtracted in the dry period behind the subsurface dam. But the subsurface dam also requires the right kind of sediment which must be already available in the, in the riverbed um, and also a base to put the, uh, the dam on. Finally, last example for water pens, which is just a retention basin with open water storage. Uh, if you can construct it with local materials, uh, it can be much more cost effective. But for that, you need a location where material with low infiltration rates are locally available. So those are all characteristics about the landscape. And what I just told you can be summarized with a number of characteristics of the landscape which determines which kind of technique fits at what location. You can think of what kind of geological informations, elevation and topography, um, about the soil characteristics, the flow accumulation, um, and those are all things you can well, uh, obtain from normally general available data. But there are also things you really need to go into the field to uh, validate or to detail, and those are more or less summarized on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, for example, where are the impermeable, impermeable layers in the subsurface? Um, what are the infiltration rates? Yes? At what slide What slide do you see in front of you? Because we don't see the slides moving. Is that correct? It uh, depends on landscape characteristics. Do you see that? That is the, the third slide? The sixth slide already. The fifth slide. Okay. Then we don't see you moving. So if you can just uh, say next slide, I will move the slide to the next slide. Okay, so what slide are you now seeing? Now I'm having slide 5. So what fits where in the landscape, our infographic? Yeah, so that's what I just explained, that there are, for all those different techniques, you need to find a place in the landscape where it really fits. So let's go to the next slide. Now you see, it depends on the landscape characteristics, isn't it? Okay, correct. Um, and this is the slide I was just talking about, that on the uh, left-hand side you see things which are 
more or less generally available, the geological uh, formations, etc. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see um, information which is uh, well, which you have to determine locally. For example, uh, the impermeable and permeable layers in the subsurface, where they exist and where they don't exist, uh, the infiltration rates, the sediments in the riverbeds, the depth of the hard rock. And actually what we did within this project is that we went to four locations in the area which were representative for the larger area to collect this specific information, but also to be able to scale up to the whole of northern Kenya. Next slide, please. Um, and by this way, we collected various sources of information. And here you see in the middle um, the pictures of this more or less generally available data and added with our own measurements. You see on the left hand side the measurement of uh, the, the water quality, but also you see it on the right hand side. It's the, the secondary data, you would say, because there's so much knowledge available with the people living in this area. They're talking to these people and um, using their knowledge about the drought and which resources are flowing, etc., is really of value to understand the area. Next slide, please. Lieslop, can I say something? I see that uh, we all need to manually uh, go to our next slides. So if I can ask everybody to um, to go along with when Lieselot says next slide, to press the button on the left uh, low part, bottom part, when you can see slide 8 of 13. So if you can scroll all the way to uh, slide 8, then we are we all have the same screen. Sorry for this uh, inconvenience. I hope everybody knows how to do this. If not, please uh, drop a message in the chat box. I'll explain. Sorry, Lisa, lot for interrupting you on this. No problem. So the slide we are now at is the slide which says what fits where in northern Kenya. And actually there should pop up some uh, indications to make it even more complicated. So maybe it works if you uh, put on the next, but maybe not. Um, I will tell you what you see here. Um, you see here the map, which is the end result of this project, indicating all the different zones with different potential for 3R interventions. And um, highlighting some of those areas, if you see the, the light blue areas, those are areas red uh, uh, shallow water has a high potential, so infiltrating water in this area and subtracting it with shallow wells would be a good option in those areas. Um, another option which I want to highlight is the areas which have the, the dots on it, the blue dots. Uh, these are areas where the infiltration rate is rather low, which is something which can be used to cost-effectively build uh, water pens for open water retention over there. Another option I would like to highlight is in the green areas, which have a high potential for sand dams. And it's not only in the, the green areas, you see light and, uh, light and dark green, both have a high potential for sand dams. But uh, you also see that there is an, a zone uh, around the dark green areas. Uh, which also has potential for sand dams, but also high potential for subsurface dams, because they are more the, the flatter areas uh, in which the right kind of sediment is uh, expected for sand dams or subsurface dams. And sand dams are expected to be more beneficial in the higher areas, which are a bit steeper, and subsurface dams can be very beneficial in the more uh, uh, less steep areas. So just a, a number of examples for that. What you see here is an overview of a, a large area where we used the information of four representative locations to scale up to the full of northern Kenya, highlighting the potential of the different options to retain water and make it available in the dry period. OK, next slide. I want to tell you what are the ways you can use such a map as I just showed to you. Well, 
what we saw already in this project is that it serves as an inspiration for interventions, interventions in addition to those currently applied in the area. Because of this map, we could, for each of the locations, make a long list with options uh, that could be considered uh, based on the physical uh, characteristics. Uh, so that, that served as inspiration. Also, it indicates possible target regions to apply specific kinds of interventions. For example, if you're starting a project in which you only want to build thin dams, then you can use this map to see what are the most uh, potential regions to go to to do your thin dam project. It can also work as a it can serve as a base to work on an area integrated view, for example, to connect examples in different areas. And we saw this already that um, physically comparable areas in the north of the northern Kenya and in the west um, could communicate to each other and see that things which were working in one area could also be applied to another. So overall, it serves as inspiration, a planning tool, and an evaluation tool, which is mainly for the feasibility phase. Please go to the next slide. Well, one of the things I want to highlight in this is that it leads to informed decision making. And where it's good practice that communities are consultants to know what they prefer uh, for kind of techniques which suit their local needs and ambitions. Um, I think that's a very good practice, but what we help them with based on this approach, this landscape-based approach, is that the dialogue becomes based on the broader possibilities than just the possibilities that are locally known. Next slide, please. Who can benefit from this landscape-based approach? Well, it can be the implementing organizations, and that's what we already did in this uh, uh, project, we worked together with implementing organizations who already worked with this map to identify what are the physically uh, most appropriate locations and options to store water. But it can also help policymakers and coordinating bodies, especially to evaluate uh, um, what, what kind of implementation uh, would fit best. Um, in the end, also funding organizations are interested and can really be helped by this kind of map. Uh, it can help them to indicate different options to provide funding for, but it can also provide as an example uh, of a feasibility phase which they could uh, require as a first step in the project before implementation starts to be sure that the most cost-effective uh, solution is selected. Okay, next slide, please, and the last slide of this presentation, because I want to summarize. Summarizing with that we identified uh, zones with various characteristics in northern Kenya, and for all of these zones, we showed what are the three R potentials for these areas. This provides inspiration to export good practices from one area to another. And it also served as a, a nice forum for uh, organizations which were working in different parts of the area to communicate with each other and to learn from each other. Well, the TRIA potential map pro provides guidance for different uh, uh, organizations implementing policymakers, funding organizations. and Something which is important to note is that the map is partly based on general information. So before implementation, it should always be complemented with local site-specific information. But it gives a good overview. And the approach which we developed for Northern Kenya is applicable for various regions. So it could also serve as an example for a method for other areas. Well, with the last slide, now the really the last slide I want to end. If you press next, you see the water buffering we always say with 3R. Sometimes you're standing on a solution without knowing it. We would like to help you to discover what are those solutions you're standing on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
very much, Lisa Lop, for your presentation. We are uh, now, well, we have all the presentations uh, been carried out. So I would like to continue with the questions. Many questions have already um, entered through the chat box. What I'll do, I'll paste them below, and we start with um, questions addressed to Martin. Martin, if you can go back um, with your uh, webcam. I'll see you. The first question. Um, I'll just copy them right now. And in the meantime, you can also keep asking questions in the chat box. I do see that we have 10 minutes left, but um, well, if everybody agrees to stay a bit, we might extend that. First question is asked by Samuel Jakinda. Dear Martin, I am Samuel from NIA. We are implementing sand dams funded by rain through Sassel. In one of the sand dams, water continued to flow long after cessation of rains. Is it true that when um, that if we construct sand dams in succession, we may turn a dry sandy river to almost permanent river? Can you yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think it can be done, but uh, but I'm also thinking that he would be that river would be the first of its kind. Um, the uh, probably what I can say is that um, um, the river was already permanent, only that the water was flowing underground. Uh, so the the answer is yeah the the river was already permanent only that some of the water has been retained and some of the water is still uh, still flowing uh, but now you've just brought it more to the surface but I'm uh, I'm really happy to hear that uh, uh, the sand dams in uh, Cagliano are functioning so well and okay. shall I shall I just continue with the next one. Yeah, the next one is also for you. Um, yes, please continue. If you want, you can uh, switch on your uh, video. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so start sharing. Yeah, there you have it. Here I am. Yeah, just one button remaining. Um, have you done any monitoring on sand dam and groundwater uh, uh, levels? Um, no, unfortunately not, and I wish we had done it. There has been some research uh, done uh, some time ago, I think it was uh, five or six years ago, <clears throat> on water levels and, uh, and sand dams. Um, the results of that research were, uh, was quite good, so you could see that uh, in general the water level rose considerably um, with the sand dams. Um, but monitoring the water level is quite, quite tricky. And you need someone to look after these uh, uh, these piezometers all the time. I'm really uh, hoping that uh, at some stage we can get a, a research grant somehow, or we can get a, a, a research going which doesn't last just a few months, but uh, lasts like maybe uh, maybe five years or uh, uh, or even longer. Sand dams are uh, are quite tricky. If you uh, oh. These are quite a number of questions. Um, they need time to mature, so if they don't work in the first year, maybe in the second year they uh, they start to do something. I've seen sand dams that uh, that didn't work at all for five years, and then all of a sudden they started to produce water. Um, yeah, for uh, for monitoring and evaluation, that is terrible. Uh, but um, I think if you have long-term research then you would be in a better position to say something about it. Moving around a bit. Uh, where am I? I'll paste them again. Uh, I remember there was one question, oh here we go. Who owns the structures? Every every kind of uh, 3R structure is uh, um, uh, has a different ownership arrangement. I suppose if you see the the tanks, so the the roof water harvesting tanks, these are preferably owned by uh, by individuals. Uh, sand dams, however, are usually not owned by uh, individuals. They tend to be community-based um, structures. 
So the way RAIN uh, works is through local organizations like uh, um, Samuel Diakinda from NIA, who, um, who constructs construct and, and um, uh, through local communities. So the local communities participate in the construction of these sandans, and in the end of the program, they become owners of these sandans. Um, I'll kick in the, the, question, the question on maintenance uh, right away. That is still the community issue. However, when constructed well, uh, there is no maintenance. It's just a wall uh, that needs to be done. The maintenance that can happen is uh, the pump. Um, if you have an offtake well with a pump, there needs to be a bit of maintenance. But otherwise, with uh, sand dams, the water is stored underground. I'll go to the next question by Hans, who, uh, by Han, who enjoyed the presentation. Um, however, nowadays more people need to use the water uh, more than before, so the pressure on the source is on. Um, might be more expensive to make more smaller units, yes. Indeed, it's more expensive, uh, but on the long run, it's more sustainable. And um, maybe my, my answer is too simple, but if you need more water, then you just need to build more dams. And particularly if you do it in a, in a way that is environmental sustainable. So rather than building more um, sand, more uh, boreholes or more shallow wells that deplete the underground water, better build more dams and more uh, structures that retain water for everyone to use. And it's more expensive, of course, but um, if you consider, for instance, the investment costs that go into water management in the Netherlands and you compare it to, uh, to some of these dams that, uh, that we are building, yeah, what is expensive? It's, uh, it's, a matter of, um, it's a matter of sustainability and, uh, and yeah. I think the, the question by, uh, by Samuel uh, Ocoloni about the management, that is uh, something I've, uh, I've already answered. So we implement mainly through local organizations in the country. Yes, there are still some questions to you, uh, Mar Martin. And um, one is from Indira Shakia. She asks, what is the oldest Sandam project that has been assessed from different aspects? Do you have any clue on that? I'm not getting the question. What is the oldest sand dam that has been assessed? So I think she means, but Indira, please correct me if I'm wrong. So what is known, uh, what kind of uh, information is out there on the oldest sand dam project? Um, anecdotal, anecdotal information. I know that they are there. I've seen uh, a number of them, and I know they are still recharging uh, or keeping water in the system. But again, and there is too little research on um, um, uh, on, on water levels, on uh, um, yeah, on how much quantity uh, uh, of water is there. Okay. There's also another question to you. It's raised by Walter. Does evaporation affect the salinity of water in sand and subsurface dams after a time? Let me let me. Place this for you in the box. Water, does evaporation affect the salinity of the water in sand and subsurface dams after some time? Uh, not to my experience, because the the water that is in uh, sand dams or subsurface dams is not saline. Um, it's rainwater that is uh, flowing through these rivers. So the, as far as I know, the water is never as saline as the deep underground water that you uh, that you get in um, um, from boreholes. And ah. there is one other question by Indira. I think you partly answered that already. She asks, what are the technical problems um, people face uh, in the Sandam project? So not about the social complex, but the technical problems. Yeah, the 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 most 
complicated issue with uh, um, with the sand dams is siting and the difficulty in predicting the the water flow. Um, so you might find a site which is quite good, but then some uh, somewhere upstream there is a crack in the underground uh, rock, and uh, you lose all the water through that crack. So the um, Sandams are very tricky. Uh, you, the siting is very, very complicated. Um, on a, the siting itself is not complicated, but it's extremely difficult to predict whether or not a sand dam will work. Then another question from our colleague in Turkey. Do you know if there is any project on that in Turkey, any sand dam project? I don't know, and I don't think so, but I'll be very happy to, uh, to come to Turkey and uh, try it. Okay, point taken. And a question for Mirage. Do you have a positive example of water that has been retained by sand dams and used for crop production? How does it work? Um, I think even uh, Samuel uh, from uh, NIA will have an answer for that also. But uh, yes, there, uh, there have been uh, 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 in Cajado and also in Kitiwi quite a number of uh, very positive um, uh, experiences with water that has been retained in a sand dam that is then pumped up by uh, farmers around uh, the riverbank and uh, uh, and used for for crop production not throughout the year and not uh, completely into the dry season but just to lengthen the the, um, the period in which the plants have water and then there is i think a final question for you from one guy do you have any experience on the use of stand dams to recharge groundwater sources? So specifically focusing on groundwater. Yes, uh, I do. I, I know, um, but it's uh, unfortunately that is unintentional. So um, in some of the sand dams that, uh, that I know, uh, there has been an unintended positive consequence of groundwater sources upstream that have been uh, recharged through a sand dam. But as, as already said before, it's very difficult to predict and to say, okay, if you put a sand dam here, uh, 100 meters or 200 meters or half a kilometer up, upstream, you'll have a recharged uh, groundwater table. Yes. As I think uh, uh, Lisa Lott also explained, it, it really depends so much on, much on the, uh, the geology and the geohydrology of the location. So, I have the experience that groundwater sources are recharged, but I don't have the experience of deliberately recharging groundwater sources by, uh, by sand dam. Mm -hmm. Only very close to the sand dam itself. Uh, so uh, the offtake points of uh, sand dams are usually very close to the river, uh, to the riverbed. So you use the water that is recharged in the, in the riverbed. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I see that one guy might be typing a response to that, and there's one more comment on it. Oh, he says, thank you very much. Um, okay. Communities in Cajado, says Samuel Jacinda, have been using water from scoop holes for irrigation. Construction of sand dam makes this water readily available and in substantial quantities. I think that's just a comment that the person would like to share. Then I would like to ask Lisa Lot if you can um, turn on your webcam. There are uh, two questions already for you. Um, the first question is asked by Indira Shakya. And she asked, that all sounds good, referring to your presentation, of course. But in how far would abstraction upstream affect water sources downstream? Oh, sorry, this is the question of Han. Were our quantities extracted too small? Yes, and that's an important point, of course. If you're buffering water, you are maintaining it at one location and making it not available for a location downstream. I think in this area um, that uh, Del Martin showed it really nicely, that there's a lot of water which is falling there. There's about the same amount of rain as in the Netherlands but it's falling in one big shower. It's only raining for about six days a year in this area, and then the rest of the period is quite dry. So because this large amount of water are falling in such a short period, 
Probably um, buffering the water will never cause a problem downstream if you do it indeed with those small interventions. But you are totally right that it's important to look at uh, the downstream effects of upstream uh, interventions. Um, this was not part of this project, but I think in the next project it will be very important to make the full water balance of the area and see how much water you can maintain without problems downstream. So it would be a nice next project. Thank you. There is a next question. That one is the one from Indira Shakya. She asked, what mm -hmm. is a best scale cost effective for this map? Do you have any idea yeah. of that? Well, you can develop this map at different scales. Um, in this project, we developed it for the full of Northern Kenya, which was also the question uh, of the project, because this was the scale uh, where the implementing organizations would be working. Um, so it can be done at this scale. It can also be done at a somewhat smaller scale, say the scale of just one province. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on your project. Um, you can also look at a very uh, detailed catchments and then look into detail uh, what can be done there and what can be placed best in that area. But actually, um, before selecting a location in which you want to do your project, I would suggest that you make such a map uh, in advance. Uh, There's a map on a larger scale, say the scale of a county, a province, or maybe a part of, of, of the country. Um, and then from that, select a smaller area to make a map or a study in more detail. Okay, thank you for Not that. To answer the question. I think you answered the question uh, very well. But if uh, indeed I would like to know more, she can ask, of course. Then in the meantime, we can go to um, the question by Niraj Ar Akaria. I hope I pronounced it well. How um, is the 3R opportunity map developed? What extent of scientific investigations are involved for this? Yeah. Well, that's a good question about the method, of course. I already saw also in a remark that a lot of geo, uh, hydrological knowledge is uh, required for such a map. And that's a totally correct remark, because that's the base for this map. It's really geological knowledge. Um, we use the export knowledge uh, of my colleagues who have, uh, well, several of my colleagues have a broad experience in going into the field uh, for the siting and selection of 3R options. Uh, and from their expert knowledge and the uh, extensive geohydrological knowledge, uh, we try to summarize uh, what are the ways, the, 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 um, the way we are selecting the, the options if we are in the field. And based on this experience, we try to scale it up with the information which is generally available for a larger area. So it is expert-based, but also really based on the geohydrological uh, circumstances and characteristics of the area. And based on that, it's um, well, the, the knowledge is made upscalable. Thank you. So for it's a combination of. Yeah, of the geohydrological knowledge, the um, field experience, the knowledge about uh, all those different uh, interventions, and then also the combination with uh, um, the generally available, say, example, geological maps, yeah. which are, that's important to say, this generally available information is also verified in the field again at those four locations uh, which we selected as representative for the full area. Uh, so at those locations we verified the generally available data to come to, well, as much as possible, a uh, very uh, good um, a map which, which is representing as far as possible the reality. Thank you very much, Lisa, lot for the answers. I think those are all the questions that were raised uh, up to now. Um, I wanted to put on my webcam, but somehow that's not working at this moment. So then I would just like to um, 
tell everybody that we uh, have a recording of this meeting available afterwards on the waterchannel.tv slash webinar. And um, also over there you will find many resources. Ah, there I am. And um, for now I would like to thank all the speakers for their very interesting presentations and also uh, th yeah, thank you very much to all the participants for all the questions. If there is anything you would like to ask to us, like um, regarding presentations, etc., you can always uh, send an email to info at thewaterchannel.tv and all materials uh, related to 3R are available at www.bbuffer.com. Then the website of Lisa Lutz's uh, company Acacia Water is acaciawater.com. Then you're also invited to um, join the Rain for Food Network, especially on their Twitter account, Rain Water for Food. So thank you all very much. Um, I also see still a question if the copies of the presentations are also available. Yes, definitely. Everything that we have will be shared on the website, uh, whatchannel.tv slash webinar, then you will find it uh, automatically. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope to meet you in the next meeting.